we've been master planning every race course, so looking at what could we do to, to bring in some new new real estate through development, but also to enhance our existing built environment. How can we really improve uh, our existing infrastructure to make it you know, fantastic and relevant for racing of tomorrow? Uh, we've been doing a planning piece. We've been out speaking to JV partners, investors, uh, potential occupiers of all different sorts of sectors. Um, and it's about pulling all this information together and coming up with a, a strategy for each asset on a case by case basis because um, they are so different. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Uh, today, we're joined by Stuart Mitchell, Managing Director, Group Property at the Jockey Club. The Jockey Club is one of the world's most respected sports organisations, host to some of the UK's most prestigious races, such as the Cheltenham Gold Cup and Epsom Derby. Stuart is responsible for all real estate investment, asset and development management across the Jockey Club's multi-billion pound portfolio. Prior to this, Stuart was director and head of third party asset management at New River REIT, and he started his career at BNP. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. The Jockey Club, that is a, an odd move. Well, that was at least my first reaction when I heard that, that Stuart landed there. But there is a method to the move. And I'm absolutely delighted that Stuart is uh, joining us on the podcast today. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Well, look, um, I know you've got plans to build a, a billion uh, pound real estate business at the Jockey Club. But before we get into, into that, a question that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast is, uh, is ordinarily, how did you get into real estate? But I'm going to ask you, why not golf? Well, I had a good crack at golf <laughs> uh, as, a, as, a, as a youngster. Uh, and I brought a lot of energy into doing that. Um, but I, I didn't make it. Uh, had, had, had come a time when you realise it, it's just not happening, despite how many hours you put into it and practice and determination. And uh, yeah, I think I had a, a realisation that um, perhaps real estate was the way for me. So it was your backup, backup choice, was it? It's it's what I do at the weekends now. <laughs> Play golf at the weekends as well as juggling kids and family life. Correct. Well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've got three kids, a wife, and we're we're very busy at the weekends and yeah, I, I don't get as much golf as I might have liked to done in the past. So tell me then, you, um, you grew up in Scotland? Yeah, I, I grew up in Scotland in, in Aberdeen, um, one of four children. Um, uh, my father was uh, a charter surveyor, had, okay. a, had, had a property, very successful property company. Um, he was a um, very, very hardworking, determined, her uh, father and really taught you know, myself and my brothers and sister that we know what hard work looks like and, and, and nothing in life is for free. If you want to get anything in life, you, you've got to put in the, the hard yards and the graft. And he, he certainly showed that to uh, myself and my brothers and sister. Um, but uh, my mother, she was uh, kind of an expat from, uh, came, grew up in Africa and she came back to Scotland and was um, you know, a very outgoing person, very sociable, had lots of friends. Our door was always open to lots of people when we were growing up. Um, and I think the combination of, of my father being in property and, and my mother being a very sociable person, probably the two qualities lend themselves to, to pursuing a, a career in property. So you always had that, um, I guess, exposure or conversation around the dinner table about real estate when did it dawn on you that that is really what you want to focus on well uh i i i, I struggled at school uh, as a youngster academically uh, and my real outlet um was through sport funnily enough um, so not just golf but rugby hockey cricket tennis swimming um Myself and my brothers and sisters, we, we did quite a few sports to quite a high level. And uh, I've always believed that sport is a great incubator for anyone getting into property or in business in general, because it teaches you, you know, teamwork, teaches you how to be a leader, teaches you um, determination to practice hard, uh, how to win, uh, how to deal with defeat um, and how to get back up and, and start again. And uh, 
I really um, thrived through sport uh, in comparison to academics when I was a youngster. And um, uh, you know, in, in my teenage years, uh, sadly, you know, mum and dad divorced and I kind of struggled a bit at school. So I got kind of sent off to, to boarding school to have another crack of the whip. Um, and uh, and I, I, I did manage to get, get, get some good A-levels to, to, to set me my, 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 on my way to university. But uh, I didn't want to do that. I wasn't ready. And um, when I finished school, having made some, some great friends, I, uh, I took myself off to Africa. And I had a, a gap year in South Africa. And when I came back from South Africa, where I was teaching in a school, uh, but when I was out there, I was practicing golf every day. And um, when I got back from Africa, I, I was quite good at golf. And that's when I did pursue a career in professional golf, age 19. And my parents, I think, made some great parental decisions to allow me to, to try it, to get it out of my system. And I, I did that for a year, um, tried really hard, uh, but sadly didn't make it because probably I should have started 10 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, and that was a bitter uh, pill to swallow, swallow, because um, you know I, was, I really wanted that. And then one day, my my dad kind of sat me down, and uh, who has always been my my mentor and the person I go to for for counsel, and he said to me, "Look, you know how how's the golf going?" And I said, "Yeah, it's good. I'm about to um, apply for my PGA." And and he said. Um, it says here on the form you you um, you need three GSE, GCSEs, uh, and I said, yeah, I, I know, uh, I've got that, Dad. And he said, Stuart, you've you've got three A levels. Um, I think I think you've had your fun now. Um, however, I think we should have a, a chat about the next stage. And and the next stage was um, going off to you know university to study land management at, at Reading. Uh, I did a short kind of four months traveling around Australia before I went. Um, but then I, in kind of 2002, landed in, in Reading to study land management. That must have hit quite hard, that conversation, and, and the realization or the dawning of the fact that actually, um, yeah, your kind of dream to go and be a professional golfer might not materialize. I think when you're young and you're in your teenage years, you need some, some guidance like that. And I probably, if my father didn't have that chat to me I, I probably would have would still be bumbling around as a as a pro golfer somewhere in the world not very good and, and wondering where I, I went wrong so I, I'm forever grateful to my parents for stopping me in my tracks and, and resetting and, and setting me off in the right way which only parents can do. So you landed at Reading you did land management um, for a few years and then and then post that what what job did you get and, and how did that come about? Uh, so after Reading, um, where you know I made many great friends who I still keep in touch with, as you can imagine, they all work in property, and I see many of them regularly. Uh, I I I, got, I remember I got eleven first round interviews and four second round interviews, and my elder brother, who, who also works in real estate, I I remember him saying to me, "Look, I just don't understand why you're you're not getting a job," and um, you know, so I've done all these interviews and my CV looked, you know perfectly acceptable on, on paper, but uh, I, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, I, I, I was wearing the wrong suit, uh, is what I put it down to. I probably was trying to emulate my father of the 1980s, and I was wearing this dreadful chalk striped suit to, to interviews, which, you know, hindsight's a great thing, and, uh, it, you know, just probably wasn't appropriate, you know, when you go to an interview, Certainly, back in the 2000s, you should just you know be very plain and blue suit, plain tie, plain shirt. And thankfully, my elder brother pulled me to one side and said, "Look, just put on a plain suit, go to your interview." And my next interview was Fuller Pizer, and uh, and I got the job uh, on the graduate program there. And who 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 is that? What company is that? It's no longer Full, around. Fuller Pizer got bought by uh, what is now BNP Paribas Real Estate. Um, Fuller Pizer was a uh, industrial and logistics specialist, um, but catered for all sectors. Uh, so I joined the, the graduate program there, 
um, which was fantastic. I got an opportunity to do valuations. I got an opportunity to do lease advisory, business rates. Uh, I did retail agency, and then I finished doing uh, capital markets, doing retail investment. Um, and it was it was fantastic. Made lots of great friends. Learned lots of things. Uh, after one year at Philip Arthur, we got bought, and I kind of finished um, my APC, and, and I, I spent you know five years at uh, BNP Paribas doing retail investing. Yeah, I ended up specialising in in retail investment, um, which was a great place uh, to learn, and we had lots of great transactions both on the sales side and the the buying side. Uh, at that time, mainly in retail warehousing uh, and high street, and um, you know that that was kind of what 2005 to 2010. So obviously we had the, the global financial crisis through that. Um, I remember like it was yesterday, the day when you know basically one person from every department at every kind of level was going to be made redundant, and um, I, I somehow kept my job as a, uh, in, in the um, investment team. I was no better or any worse than the next person. It was really down to the, a flip of a coin. And um, I, I kind of pinched myself how, how lucky I was to, to keep, keep my job at the time because it was tough for everyone back then. It, are there any parallels to today's market? Because you know, there's obviously some challenges. And I think, you know, I saw something in the press that it said it's the, it's the worst quarter in 10 years for, for kind of raising fresh capital. Uh, it's well documented some of the challenges that we're going through as, a, as an industry in the sector and certainly investment volumes are down. Are there any parallels that you can see um, today compared to, yeah, to back then? Yeah, I mean, there def- definitely are parallels. I, I remember back then uh, we were instructed to offload about three or 400 Barclays banks um, because they were just surplus to requirement and, and not needed. And that was back in you know, 2008, 2007, 2008. And, um, you know, Similar thing is, is happening today with, you know, many retailers offloading stores or going into administration. Um, so yes, there were certainly on the retail side. I, I saw some similarities. You moved um, after that that stint at BNP to to New River. How did that come about, and and why did you move, and what was the timing of, of that move? Well, I moved because when I qualified uh, doing my APC, I, I I always wanted to do kind of fund management, investment management. And um, I didn't get a role doing doing that within BNB Paribas, even though we had an investment investment management arm. And I ended up doing doing the capital markets. And uh, I, I I started to get a bit disheartened about you know is this what I want to do going long long term being an, an investment agent? Um, you know I, I remember there was probably the defining moment was when uh, I was working on a deal. Um, to buy a particular asset, and uh, my my kind of boss at the time kind of went off on on a holiday to, um, and uh, just as the deal had, had been agreed and gone into legals and told me to get on and do the purchase report, um, and uh, you know when he got back the, the deal closed and um, uh, on the kind of Friday and I remember going to um, our secretary at the time and saying. Uh, you know that deal's just just closed. Um, can you get a deal celebration in the in the diary? Because you know a, a deal celebration lunch, you know, was always a big part of of being in the transactional world, and and especially when you're a young you know graduate or a, a young sphere at the time. And and she said to me, I'm I'm really sorry, Stuart, that the the the, the lunch was on Friday. And I was like, whoa, okay. Um, and you know that really. The person at the time probably doesn't know this, but that really upset me. And I just thought that's, that's just not how you behave as a team. And um, I, uh, I don't know, I just I took it quite personally. And um, and I've uh, actually that that experience has taught me, you know, you should, you know, how you treat people. And I was always brought up to treat others as you would like to be treated. And I vowed uh, to myself on that day that I, if, if ever th- something similar happened, I would make sure, you know, I share the success with my wider team. And um, so that kind of got my head up um, above the parapet to start looking at at other options. And uh, if I kind of reflect on what those options were, it's it's quite comical looking back because perhaps some of them just were not right for me. I remember I went for a a role with a a new startup from a very successful person post the global pandemic. And I I thought that was perhaps a bit risky going out with a one-man band. 
I, uh, I went for an analyst role at a big um, Australian bank um, and uh, I got a second round interview. And I remember the chap interviewing me said to me, you know, you're, we've interviewed 20 people, you've got fantastic um, market knowledge but you know, not the analyst skills. And I, I wasn't an analyst. I, I was a charter of error coming from a you know, a surveying practice. Um, uh, I went for a role at a, one of the big pension funds, one of the big household pension funds, and I wasn't, wasn't quite sure if that was for me. And then in the back of the Estates Gazette, as you know, where we, we all used to look for jobs before the days of, of LinkedIn and, and all, all the other, other channels, um, I saw this role with um, this company called New River Capital, and I had to be a retail asset manager. And I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. I came from a, a retail background, I had um, capital market experience, I had agency experience, I had contacts in the market, and um, I thought that, that is exactly what I want to do. And context-wise, retail was the darling child at the time, right? There was a lot of money plowing into it. Um, is that fair or had it kind of been through a bit of a change post GFC? Um, I think re retail was starting to polarize the, 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 the best in class, the uh, destination assets were, were um, doing well um, and, and were of a certain asset, uh, a certain type of property that, that drew the biggest footfalls and whatnot. But then there was the other side of, of retail where you know, New River was focused, which is on the food value and convenience side. And that, you know, that was definitely, um, the side that I believed in, and um, that's where you know, one you know, consumers are spending their um, non-discretionary spend, and uh, that's that was that was definitely the side of retail I was wedded to at, at that time. And you wanted to get out of the transactional investment focused role into more of an asset execution yeah, business like plan. Yeah, many people role. coming from a, an agency environment, you kind of want to be, be in control of your own destiny. Um, I think. Uh, being an agent, you know, some agents are just phenomenally good and, you know, just do deal after deal after deal. I, th I think it's difficult to be an agent when you're young um, because you don't have that kind of little black book of contacts, of knowledge of the market. And, um, you know, it, it's, it is difficult. And actually looking back, I, I, I truly believe it's better to be a, a good bag carrier as a youngster than trying to be the hero doing your own deals because it, it takes time to develop a knowledge of your of your sector, of your market, of of, of the people. And actually, I learned a lot more as an agent, um, listening and learning to the kind of partners and directors in in the investment team who knew a lot more than I did, um, than trying to do my own deals. Yeah. You joined as an asset manager. Can you just talk to me about your kind of career journey within? New River and what you worked on, because you were yeah. there for quite a long time. Yeah, I was there for 12 years in the end. Um, and uh, it took a little while just to, to, to get in. I, I kind of remember sending my CV off um, and I didn't hear anything back for, for quite some time. And um, I actually you know, chased the recruitment agent and you know, he, he, he you know, couldn't give a, a defined answer of you know, what was happening. And, and I really wanted this role. You know, I just thought this was absolutely right for me. New River Capital, as it was at the time, was a, a, a startup that had just uh, IPO'd and listed on the, the AIM. And um, I really wanted the, the job. So I took the bold decision to phone up the office. And lo and behold, who would answer the phone but uh, the chief executive, David Lockhart. And I had the most lovely conversation with, with David, uh, who was the most charming uh, man you could ever dream of and he was so kind and nice to me on the phone and said look um, send your CV in and I'll, I'll, I'll have a read and, and we'll, we'll come back to you and I, and I remember thinking right this is this is my chance this is this is my moment to, to to get in so I didn't just send my CV I I sent a list of all the transactions that I had been involved in um, in my career I sent a list of all my contacts be it landlords be it agents be it retailers, be it occupiers. I literally put my, my heart on a plate. That, like, this was me, this is everything. I really wanted it. And um, one thing after another, I, I was invited in for an interview and, and you know, delighted to say I, I got the job uh, as an asset manager. It's a risky strategy as you touch on, because I guess in 50% of those cases, um, yeah, and certainly in my experience, it kind of brought you back to the 
through the headhunter or the recruiter and you need to kind of follow the due, due process yeah. um, but you know you create your own luck of sorts, yeah there's a bit of luck and, in and that you do it and you position it in the right way yeah, uh, yeah you the, the, the recruitment agent was still involved in the process all the way to the end but it got it got my my name on the table so you joined as an asset manager can you just talk to me about what you were involved with and some of the projects and, and yeah. how that kind of evolved so when i joined it was a it was a real big culture change you're know, coming from a big you know successful co corporate like bmp paraba and um you know, when I remember I joined, there was there was like only six people there. I was like kind of seventh person through the door. It was very quiet. You know, if you if you made a phone call, you know, I, I remember thinking, God, everyone can hear exactly what I'm saying <laughs> uh, on the phone. So it was a, a totally different culture. But it was ultimately a startup. You know, we we, we had just IPO'd and, and um, just had our kind of first successful capital raise and and deployed some some um, of that capital. So I remember when I joined, I was like a kind of seventh person person at the door. We we had 70 million um, and uh, of assets and, and 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 seven assets at the time, and uh, and we we just went on to grow and grow and grow into what turned out to be you know a fantastically successful REIT with a um, you know in the end 1.3 billion assets under management, um, well over you know, 30 shopping centres, you know, 36 shopping centres under management at our peak, 19 retail parks and over 700 pubs. So it was. It was an amazing journey over the, the 12 years. Um, I, I was very fortunate to grow through the ranks. Um, I was not only you know, an asset manager, but I was probably like the, the original tea boy. I was the one that cleared the meeting rooms. I was the one that loaded the dishwasher. I was the one that did the modeling. I was the one that went and did the inspections and, and did the bag carrying really uh, in the early days. And um, you know that that teaches you a lot, and and uh, I, you know, in those early days, it was all about work hard. We all worked incredibly hard. We were all so determined to make a success of this, and it was such a a, a wonderful experience to be a part of, of New River to see us grow from a, a, a small new new company to be something quite substantial and great, uh, and 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 best in class. How was it funded or financed or? How did you facilitate that growth? Uh, well, through a series of capital raises um, and, uh, and, and debt. Um, New River had, had a, and still has, a, a very successful business model. It was by buying high yielding retail assets, uh, generally, generally anchored by food, food stores to drive footfall, uh, securing uh, a low cost of debt and the arbitrage after operational costs was the profit that was redistributed back to our, our shareholders who enjoyed significant growth in, uh, uh, in our dividends across over the years. And it was and continues to be a successful business model. You, um, your kind of your last role with the business for four years or so was head of third party asset management. Can you just talk to me about that role and, and where that fitted into the business as well? Yeah, well, you know, we, we had this fantastic uh, platform, you know, where not only did we, you know, we did asset management, we did development management, project management. We're all used to, you know, doing valuations, business planning, forecasting, accounts and finance. So we had this fantastic platform, which we were able to leverage um, and attract third party investors um, to, to New River. And in 2018, I was uh, I was rewarded for my kind of eight years up to that date by joining the executive committee. And at that time, I was also asked to um, spearhead our new third party asset management business, which ultimately meant that we took on board um, other people's assets, uh, shopping centers in the main, um, owned by four of them were owned by councils and one by private equity. And uh, we basically Asset, management, asset, man, asset managed and development managed those uh, retail assets for them using our platform and our skill set and our knowledge of the market. Um, and it was, it was very successful. We grew it from no assets to five assets by the time I left, um, from zero income to an income you know, well over a million pounds. And um, you know, it, was, it was really enjoyable. And that was on a fee basis rather than a um, a co-invest in a, in a promote and an upside yeah, basis. Pure, purely on an asset management fee, yeah, and development management fees. So you, you left the business in April 22? Yeah, Is that right? Uh, no, I, uh, well, like in, 
in kind of Christmas 21, yeah. um, you know, post-pandemic, um, I had been through the pandemic. I had been, had been thinking about, you know, what I, what I wanted to do next. Um, I was perhaps starting to, to look around and think, think, you know, where do I fit in at New River going, going, going forwards? Um, the pandemic, you know, I found, uh, I found a great experience actually. I think a lot of people, you know, stressed and worried, um, and found it quite daunting at, at New River, we rallied round together on, during the pandemic, and it was a great feeling of camaraderie and teamwork. And I thrived and really enjoyed actually trying to, you know, save the business, save the people, make it all work while we're all locked at home during the pandemic. But of course, the pandemic gave us all a lot of time to, to think about what we want to do going forward, um, and and you know where we fit in. And um, I I used the pandemic actually to do a, a, a an online MBA because we're all sat at home with all the spare time. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, so that came, that was a really great thing. I, I'm really glad I did that, and um, you know, it just gave me some some insight. I'm a great believer. You're always continue to learn. Um, you can never stop learning. Um, I like learning from other people. Uh, you know how to you know be successful and. Um, and that was a great thing to do. I'm really glad I did it. It wasn't real estate focused. It was just what a broader MBA. Broad, was broad, broad winded MBA, um, which you know took like three months to do. But it was a, it was a great experience, and I highly recommend it to anyone. Um, but come Christmas 21, um, in the space of a month, kind of three big things happened in my life. Uh, I had my my third child. My wife and I had, had our third child, Iona. Um, I turned 40, which always seems like a, a, a milestone in, for, for most of us. And um, I lost my mother um, all in the space of one month. And um, uh, I, I, was, I was perhaps a, a bit of a mummy's boy, so I took it quite hard. And, you know, after Christmas, um, you know, after some conversations with, with, with New River about, you know, the direction of travel, um, both my wife and I both quit our jobs wow. and we uh, went traveling for a year. So what, what was your wife doing? My wife uh, was a charter surveyor as okay. well. Um, as I said, there's 11 um, charter surveyors or people that work in property in my family. And so my wife is a charter surveyor. My brother's wife was a charter surveyor. My father-in-law is a charter surveyor. There's, you know, we, we all work in property. I've met your sister. Yeah, she, was sister River, she was at New River. She was at New River. I know what? she's not a charter surveyor, but she obviously yeah, works in property. My yeah. sister uh, works in New River, so she works in real estate. So it's, yeah, it's in the family. And your brother, your older brother yeah. as well, who I've met. Um, yeah, three of my brothers. Yeah, three of all work in real estate. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, Lisa and I both um, quit our jobs uh, in kind of. Uh, January 22 and um, we went traveling for a year with our three kids um, we kind of pegged off um, five continents 12 countries 79,000 miles I think we did in the end wow um, 29 flights um, probably not very good for my ESG credentials <laughs> um, I, I, I promised myself to, to plant 100 trees offset those and offset my 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 my, car, my carbon footprint but uh no we had a most glorious time um just as a family just being together um as a chance to 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 reset and and re rebalance and and just spend some quality time together as a family um and um it was easily the best year of my life I guess, you know, build, building or being part of the build of New River, you know, it sounds, um, it sounds like when you get involved with the project, you throw absolutely everything into it and it's almost all consuming. It sounds like it was so well needed, that break, just to, as you said, reset, spend some time with your kids. Because they're, what, seven? Uh, one, five and eight. One, five yeah. and eight. No, you know, I, I had so much fun at New River. It, it, it is full of many very bright capable people um david and alan that set up the business you know are will forever be um great mentors to me I, you know david is sadly no longer with us but alan uh, was a, a great mentor to me and i uh, was always very grateful for all the opportunity uh, he gave me um was a great mentor to me you know taught me everything i know but there's lots of other great people there very bright people um you know at every corner of the business uh, you know um the fpna Team, I was always incredibly impressed how, how 
smart they were and how bright they were. Um, but you know, the asset management team, the development management team, you know, they're all very, very capable people. People like, you know, like Emma McKenzie and and uh, people like you know Edith on the um, our chief, the chief operations officer, um, the, the finance guys. That you know, it was, a, it was a great place to be, and I really enjoyed it. But you know, after twelve years, um, it was time to do something new. And um, I think it's really important when you're taking a, a career move to really think about it and really not rush into it. And I got, I got, you know, I had various conversations with other people that I could have jumped into another job quite quickly, but I didn't want that. I wanted the time with my family. I wanted the time to travel. Um, and I wanted to really think about my next move. I was going to ask you how daunting was it to kind of leave a business of 12 years um, you know, big cool, take your kids out of nursery or school or whatever it might be, go traveling. Um, kind of coming back and reflecting on what your career looked like and where your boundaries were and what you wanted to achieve for the kind of the second part of, of your career. How did you? I think, I think when you get to 40 and if, you, if you're fortunate to have, you know, I've got a wonderful wife and three children, that are, you know, they are the most important thing to me. I think when you're a youngster starting out in a career, it's it's kind of career career career, um, but when you get older, it's it's career and family, and I think it's really important. And um, I wanted to do something for my family as much as me. And um, I think you need the breathing space to to really step back and think about what's right for you. And um, I'm glad I I'm glad I did that. And. Throughout the course of the year, well, once we weren't, tra weren't traveling, I would come back to London and I'd come up to London for coffees and lunches and, and keep, you know, keep, keep my foot in. And, and that was a really good thing to do. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, I could have ended up working for a, an, a, another business similar to New River um, or another fund or another investment manager. Um, but I'm really glad I took the time just to, just, just to stop and think about it, whether I was going to do something for myself or work for another company. Um, you know, lots of ideas were going through my mind. Um, and then in the kind of summer of, of late summer of 22, I, I got approached by the Jockey Club. So who are the Jockey Club? I know I did a little bit of an intro at the top of this, but um, I certainly naively never have heard of them before. And, and I'm yep. sure some people listening to this hadn't heard of them before. So can you just give me a bit of an overview of the business? Well, the Jockey Club are the largest uh, racecourse owner in the UK. Uh, so we have 15 race courses. Um, we have 5,000 acres of land on, on the 15 race courses, plus another 4,500 acres of land in Newmarket, which is the kind of global headquarters of, of racing. Uh, I, like you, hadn't heard of the, the Jockey Club from a, from a real estate point of view. And indeed, when, when I got the call from the headhunter, I, I kind of uh, jokingly said, um, thanks very much but you know you should really have a chat to my my wife she's a, <laughs> she's a land agent and she you know was very um equestrian focused as a as a, as a youngster and you know the the headhunter said no we're looking for someone with, like you with your skill set and that kind of pricked my ears up and to, to listen more and um then having met the team uh nevin and the wider team on uh, on the ex uh on exco um, I realized that this was a serious company with some amazing people on, on the board from a, a variety of different backgrounds and skill set and diversity and was really intrigued. And, you know, one interview after another, uh, I, I got the role. So the, the core business is obviously horse racing. Can you just expand on you know, the, the role and what you've kind of been brought in to do? Okay, so... Yeah, the business, you know, over 50% of our revenue comes from racing. 25% um, of our, our revenue comes from media. And the, the final 25% comes from a mixture of um, what we call conferencing events, um, partnerships, and gambling. And uh, real estate is actually a very small part of, of our revenue. So last year, our revenue was 236 million. Um, real estate made up 1.4% you know, of that 236, so it's like... 3.175 million. Um, we have a, an EBITDA before prize money of just over 50 million and after prize money of 20.4 million. So there's a lot of movers um, in terms of our revenue and lots of different pieces that focus into it. But re real estate is actually, in terms of income, is a small part of, of our revenue. 
but we do have a huge real estate portfolio. Uh, we have a huge built environment in terms of our grandstands, our parade rings, our stables, our conference and events facilities. And uh, you know, that's the opportunity. Um, and that's, I was, it was explained to me that the, the business wanted to take an, on a new direction of travel, a new strategy to uh, use our assets, which you know, we, we own 15 race courses, 13 of the 15 we own freehold, um, two are long leaseholds. And this is our, our biggest asset and our opportunity to, to add value to the business. And you know, my, my role at the Jockey Club, um, people can dress it up um, to be as complicated as they want, but it's, it's really simple. Um, it's to drive income from real estate, be it um, capital receipts or long-term sustainable rental income. And uh, the way we we're going to do that is by taking our built environment, our real estate, and developing out complementary uses that will sit nicely alongside our race courses to complement them, um, to, to provide facilities um, that complement the race courses, uh, to provide uh, communities. You know, race courses are, you know, always in great locations. They're always beautiful. They're always uh, in the main, uh, very close to great infrastructure, great um, transport infrastructure. So they lend themselves to be perfect uh, locations to create communities. So the obvious thing would be residential, but in the, we, hotels, BTR, senior living, um, all sorts of health and well-being um, uses lend themselves to be at race courses. And indeed, we already have many um, health and well-being and sports facilities at race courses. Um, ironically, we have six golf courses uh, within wow. the Jockey Club. Um, only that's, four. That's only f- really why you took the job. Yeah, that's really why I took the job. Yeah, only four of them are operational, but, but you know we have we have six golf courses. We have uh, in Sandown we've got a ski slope. We've got go karts. We've got you know. Um, driving ranges uh we've got football pitches cricket pitches rugby pitches you know so so race courses do lend themselves really well to to a sports arena not just racing and i guess that's a big factor that drew you to the opportunity right is the the in, the broader interest in sport that we touched on i guess there's there's being able to combine the property piece and the skill set that you have with the interest in sport more broadly even if you're not a that's not right. racing i, I you know enthusiast. I've, I'm a, I'm a failed golfer um, sitting here, and uh, but I love real estate. And I think um, most people that work at the Jockey Club and, and indeed in racing love sport. And for me to have the opportunity to, to work in sport, um, but also to work in real estate is a, is a phenomenal opportunity. And you know, we wanna grow the business, create uh, an investment platform that we can create our rental income stream so we can reinvest that income stream, whether it's rent or capital receipts, back into our built environment to make our race courses fantastic, to make them awesome, to make them places that people want to come to in the future to, to satisfy the consumers of tomorrow. And um, you know, we know that the, the jockey club and our built environment has a big capex requirement. Uh, so how's that going to be funded? And uh, we believe, you know, one of the ways we can fund that, uh, not the only way, but one of the ways to fund the CapEx requirement for our built environment is, is through our existing real estate. And so is that where you kind of maybe look at disposing of non-core assets or looking at maybe repositioning or repurposing, or rebranding existing yeah. units, um, you know, yeah, expanding on it that way or... Yeah, we're looking to develop out uh, some of our non-core real estate. So we have lots of real estate that sits around race courses that people probably wouldn't know that we own. So looking to build a, build those out um, or sell them off or do a joint venture. Um, so obvious things like BTR, senior living, we're in legals and a hotel portfolio and create an income stream, whether it's through capital receipts or rental income to reinvest back into the jockey club. So obviously, um, real estate is a small portion of the, of the income of the Jockey Club right now. And I'm sure it's looking at ways to kind of maximize income from its other existing activities. But why, why specifically within real estate uh, and why now? Well, the, the Jockey Club has its own headwinds um, in racing. 
So you know, there are th mainly three big reasons that we want to create new income streams into racing. And they are, one, to drive prize money. So in the UK, we really want to drive prize money to retain the best horses in the UK. So it's, it's well documented that many of the world's best horses are, are born and bred in the UK. But what happens is they end up going racing across the globe because flat racing is a global business. Um, so we have a real uh, urgency to drive our prize money. And if you drive prize money, you get the best horses, you get the best owners, trainers, jockeys. And, and coupled onto that is the media and the gambling and everything that is associated with, the, with that. So there's a real drive to drive prize money. Um, and second to that is to invest in our built environment, to make our race courses amazing, to make them modern and relevant and fantastic for the future. And to do that, that's through developing out other use classes that can sit alongside our race courses. The portfolio is vast. And you know so many different use classes and subsection subsectors and niches within it. How and where do you even start to try and reconcile this project? Because it's not like it's That's one a, site. It's a great question, and um, you know, having coming from a you know a kind of investment and asset management background, I've I've really had to take quite a strategic approach to my new role, and it, it's been really tempting to jump in and just get on with that project or get on with that project. Um, but I've, I've had to be quite disciplined and look at the whole portfolio with the team. You know, it's not just me, we, you know, the whole of the executive committee who come from a variety of great backgrounds, um, all, all inputting into what, what we're doing going forward. Um, actually, one of the things that really drew me to the jockey club was just the quality of, of the team in, in that, you know, we're, we're headed up by Nevin, who came from Centrica, but we've got, you know, people and we've just taken on uh, a lady from Facebook to, 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 to spearhead our, 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 our digital business. We've got you know people from m and we've got people, we had someone from Disney, we've got people who have got phenomenal racing backgrounds um, and uh, we have a real st strong um, team sheet to, to help drive this business forward. And I think uh, it's exciting what, what, what's, what's ahead of us, um, but we have to be strategic. We have to just take our time. So what we're doing this year is formulating the real estate strategy. That is, um, I've been around every single race course, uh, which has put quite a lot of miles on my car. Um, a few more, a few more trees in the coffer to go with those, uh, <laughs> those plates. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I've done kind of, 12 and a half thousand miles in the first six months, a uh, new set of tires. Uh, but I've been around all the race courses, walked the boundaries, been through all the buildings, met the teams, uh, been around meeting all the councils, getting a feel for what, what, what we own and what, what we could do in the future. Um, we've been master planning every race course. So looking at what could we do to, to bring in some new, new real estate through development, but also to enhance our existing built environment. How can we, really improve uh, our existing infrastructure to make it you know fantastic and relevant for racing of tomorrow uh, we've been doing a planning piece we've been out speaking to jv partners investors uh, potential occupiers of all different sorts of sectors um, and it's about pulling all this information together and coming up with a a strategy for each asset on a case-by-case -case basis because um, they are so different. There are, you know, we've got race courses from as north as Carlisle, all the way down to Exeter in the south. We've got three race courses in London, so they all lend themselves to different use classes. And uh, we're going to harness all the information we've we've gathered, and then next year start to be laser focused and look to bring forward some of these projects. Wow, it's uh, yeah, massive, massive job, and I guess a job that you've got to look at it through the lenses of what. 10, 15, 20 years? How do you, what is the time frames and what is the lens the, that you look the, at? The time frames will all be dependent on the success of development and planning. Um, I think the, the opportunity is through development and the time frame will be based on what's deliverable through planning. So the majority, all of our race courses sit in Greenbelt, um, but the, the obvious 
place to, to focus our attention in, is on the PDL, the, the previous developed land, and what we can do to enhance that and, uh, and build out uh, developments that complement our, our racing infrastructure. But um, it will take time. And um, you know, I've, I'm making no promises that things are just going to pop up next year because they won't. Um, it all requires, you know, identifying opportunities. It requires uh, securing you know, joint venture partnerships or agreement for leases, uh, securing planning consents, and all that takes time. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't think we'll start to see things pop out of the ground for you know, at least a, a year or two. Uh, with a with a good wind, you mentioned I think two point five percent of the revenue of the jockey club is driven directly from from real estate. One point four percent. One point four percent. How once you've done all of this, how how much of that you know, revenue or income do you reckon it will oh, it will move gold, to? Golden question. I think if my if my uh, chief executive was listening, he would probably want me to say you know fifty percent. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know grow it up into the tens, twenties, thirty millions. But the the reality is um the opportunity is huge. So we're we're currently in terms of pure real estate income it's three point one seven five. I see no reason why that can't be ten, twenty million in the next kind of ten years once these developments start to come forward. But in the short short term we also have short term opportunities to to monetize our existing portfolio through our car parks, through the exist you know the excess land that we own and you know even in the last nine months, we've been able to implement some new strategies to monetize our car parks, to bring in some commercialization. We're about to go live on an open storage portfolio on surplus land that you know is not going to affect the, the racing operations, and you know that will create uh, new income streams whilst we're working on the on the bigger picture. What what skills would you say are transferable from your kind of retail days to this? A heavily operationally intensive, diverse portfolio that you're playing with now. That's a great question. I think um, you know retail is all about um, consumer behaviour. You know, in order to, to drive value from from retail and leisure, it's about driving footfall, driving dwell time, and driving back to spend. And if, in in retail and leisure, if the if the retailers are are making money, then the um, the property companies will be making money, therefore the investors will be making money. And you know, I'm a great believer in the, the, the circle of stakeholders, uh, they're all linked. And uh, in, in racing, it's no different. We are, we're a consumer product, we're a sports business, so we are trying to attract people to come racing, to come to our venues. So it's about driving footfall, it's about driving um, dwell time, it's about driving consumer spend. So the similarities are very similar. The product is just different. I used to work in shopping centers. Uh, now I work in race courses. It, it, they are real estate assets. People come to, come to our race courses first and foremost to come racing, but why can't they come for something else? And they already do. We have really, already have a very successful conferencing and events business uh, where we make a substantial income of that every year. But why can people not come to our race courses to do other things, to you know, to stay in hotels, to to live, to work, to do other leisure pursuits? And you know that's what we're looking at doing. So the the similarities are very similar. Um, I think um, you know retail has gone through a, uh, a an enormous amount of change over the last hundred years. Um, you know, back in the the nineteen twenties, you know. The UK was, was it was all about the high street retail, and, and in the 40s came the advent of the supermarket, and in the 60s came the advent of the shopping centre, and in the 80s came the advent of retail warehousing, and in the early 2000s came the advent of online retail, and online retail grew from kind of 2001 from kind of six percent to pre-pandemic to 19.6 percent. And of course, during the pandemic, retail shot up into the kind of high, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, but post-pandemic has come come down and, and stabilised in the kind of mid 20s. And what that's saying is, you know, even if retail online spend gets up to kind of 34 percent, it's still 70, 60, 70 percent of of retail spend is still going to be in physical built retail. And it's exactly the same in racing. You know, you. 
you um you come racing you 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 come to see the sport you come to see the spectacle you come to socialize with your family and friends it's very difficult to do that at home and uh again I, for that reason I, I think there's some great similarities that you know our job is to enhance and improve um our product to to attract new audiences and retain existing audiences which is something that you know we've been doing in retail ledger for many years where does data fit into your decision making um because it's not all gut feel or back of a fag packet nowadays real estate investment development asset management um you know you're running awful lot yeah loads of different scenarios and you're, you're pulling lots of different data into to kind of give yourself the best best shot where, where does that fit in and how do you, how well, do you see that at New River, we were very data-driven, and um, I'm certainly t taking those learnings into the jockey club. We just completed a data set um, uh, through our research house where we've analyzed our catchments, we've analyzed our, our demographics, looking at the supply and demand, looking at the use classes that are, are appropriate, and, and really using that data to support our thinking, our gut feeling. Um, and not only are we doing that, but as a business, we have a huge amount of data on our customers. And uh, it's really important to, to use that to your advantage to make some sound decisions going forward. ESG is obviously a buzzword that's been banded around and gets banded around an awful, awful lot. But I'm sure that's at the heart of what you're trying to do um, as well. Uh, at the Jockey Club, like any business today, ESG is enormously important to us. Um, I am hugely impressed about the, the amount of work that happens already um, on, on all sides of ESG. Uh, we, we have solar projects, EV projects, but we do a huge amount of the S of ESG at the Joy Club in our existing communities that we, we uh, operate in. Um, we do a huge amount of, of working with local schools and communities. Um, you know, our race courses are often seen as community assets. So uh, I li would like to think that we're a big contributor to the to ESG, particularly the, 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 the S of ESG uh, today. Talk to me about your plans for the team, um, because, you know, you've probably struggled to find hours in the day because you've got such a big job. But there is plans to grow the business and grow the team and, and the property team. What what kind of people are you going to be looking to, to join the business? And well, I'm very fortunate. I've got some phenomenal people in the team already that um, have a far better knowledge of the Jockey Club than I do. Um, so I lean on with them quite, quite a lot because their, their knowledge is, is fantastic. Um, not just in the property team, but in the, the whole wider business, the, the knowledge in, in all the race courses, many people who've worked there for many years is, is phenomenal and you can only learn from these people. And um, they've been very generous with, with their time to, to educate me. Um, but also on the real estate side, we're, we're gonna grow the property team. We're, we're starting with growing um, uh, on the development side and we will, we will look to build out the, the development team uh, within the business as we, as we look to grow the business. Um, and it will be baby steps as the opportunities yeah come forward, then we'll look to grow the team uh, appropriately. And I guess in line with using balance sheet capital to reinvest, but as you touched on kind of maybe third party capital as well to, to maybe fund projects or take risks that you or the business are not comfortable doing in its entirety. Well, that's it. Risk is a really important word for, for any business and, and, and ours as well. Um, anything we do, we want to make sure that our existing core business is de-risked from any any development that we might go off and do. So it's really important that uh, we separate um, that risk on, on the real estate side from our existing core racing business. And it's highly likely that we will set, set up new entities and potentially a new property company to sit at arm's length from, from our core business to, to for, for the exact reason to de-risk it and, and protect our core business, which at the end of the day, we're a sports business, we're a racing business, and that's where we, we, we make the majority of our income. So it's important to protect that. And we've got, we've got some uh, thoughts in, 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 in motion to do that. I'm sure you do. And as well as operating it as well, separate op, op, op codes, or is that a... 
that's a kind of an idea for further down the line. Well, we really are at Upco. Um, you know, the, the Jockey Club is an operational business. Um, we we have a huge hospitality um, side to us already. Um, we have a competing events side to us. We're very comfortable being a, a, an Upco already, as well as a Propco. Yeah. And um, you know, lots of the the youth classes that we'll be looking to invest into, you know, will be Opcos. Um, not, we won't necessarily want to run them, but they'll be opcos. So, as I say, we're in legals on a, on a hotel portfolio, on a, on a, a hotel management agreement. We, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at BTR. We'll be looking at senior living. You know, th- these will be, you know, opcos potentially that we, we will or will not be a part of. Amazing. Well, look, um, a question that I ask everyone that, that comes onto the podcast is: if if you're given five hundred million pounds of equity, who are the people, what property, in which place? Would you look to, to deploy that, that capital? Well, I had a little think about this question and um, I would probably look to put it into two buckets, two funds. So I would probably look to put 250 million in, into the, the obvious meds, beds and sheds um, where you know, th- there is real growth in the market, you know, with a, an aging population with over 70s um, due to rise by 25% by 2030 with a growing population uh, with rising interest rates and, and inflation making it difficult for people to buy uh, properties. So I do think BTR and senior living will be a, will be a, a growth sector in the coming years. Um, but the other 250 million, I would have to be too, true to my, to my past in, in, in retail and leisure. I'm a great believer in, in retail and leisure, uh, particularly post uh, pandemic. I think we all crave experiences. Um, so I do think uh, the best in class retail and leisure, whether it's at the convenience side on the, the, the food value convenience side or at the other end, whether it's city centers or, or I'm a big fan of designer outlets and, and, and obviously a you know, big destination retail and leisure offers where perhaps with hotels where people can have a, a longer experience because I, you know, I, I strongly believe that every part of the population craves experiences, whether it's a, a struggling family or, or an affluent family. We all crave to spend time with our, our families and friends. And um, I think experience, experience, experience loc- locations will be important. And uh, I think we could include race courses uh, in that in the future as well. No money allocated to golf courses? No, not I'm yet. fully focused on racing. And who are the people, and, and in terms of kind of locations, where would you look at, at deploying that? Locations UK, I think um, it's a safe haven for investors. It's, it's what I know, uh, and I would feel uncomfortable investing outside the UK. Um, and the people, uh, I would you know, look at people that have um, guided me through my career, people that I, I trust and, and, and have been loyal to me. and. I can think of many people across the last 20 years that have, have guided me. So they would probably be my, like on my non-executive committee. Yeah. People like people like my father, people like my, my wife, people like uh, Alan and David Lockhart, who have been phenomenally kind to me over the years and guided me. Um, but also on the on the the day to day side, I, I'm a great believer in in your existing team. I've got a strong team at the Jockey Club. Uh, with a fantastic skill set and um, when it comes to team I truly believe it's all about hard work and graft and positivity and energy and what you don't know if you put in the the, the energy and the time you, you can learn what you don't know. Well Stuart it's been a fascinating conversation and um, it makes complete sense why you landed at the Jockey Club um, and I'm really excited to see from afar what you and the team go on to build. And um, like I said, I'm not a big horse racer myself, but maybe I should carve some time out and uh, go and uh, see the Gold Cup. Or... Well, thank you very much for having me and we'll, we'll have to get you racing to see what it's all about. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, excited to see what you do. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like, or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. 
The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website, www.rockborn.com, where you'll be able to find a wealth of information or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are and I look forward to catching you next time.